looks like you're now streaming. Okay. It says meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. That's my right. notification. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. So we be streaming. So we be streaming. Hi, I want to welcome everybody to a great another webinar, uh, VT webinar. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Today we are honored and we're excited to have Mr. Jim Lenahan. And if you guys don't know Jim, Jim is one of the premier audio engineers and trumpet players in the country. He does work for CBS, Fox, Paramount, NBC, ABC. I mean, we could be here till next Christmas and still not touch half of the things he's done. So, uh, Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Joseph. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Jim, why don't you tell us your background? Why don't you give us a little, uh, as a trumpet player, and how you got into the engineering business as well? Okay, well, I, I grew up in the Midwest, and uh, I was really lucky. I was in a small town called Clear Lake, and uh, the high school band director was a Juilliard-trained French hornist who had been groomed, actually, to play in the New York Phil, and uh, he met this girl and fell in love, and she said, I'm not raising my children in New York, which is how he ended up in the middle of nowhere in Iowa on this lovely resort lake. Right? <laughs> well, and so I was lucky enough to walk in there and uh, it, I remember very clearly it was fifth grade, fourth grade. We were gonna, we played tones, but fourth grade, you get to pick out your instrument. And I had this trumpet and it was so beautiful. And he picked it up and played the third variation of the Carnival of Venice. Just wow. played them, just played the heck out of it, right? And I just was like frozen. And I said, that's what I wanna play. So that started it. And I, you know, all along the career, all the while throughout Iowa and throughout my undergraduate at North, uh, University of Northern Iowa, and then at North Texas, I had Rich Madison was a mentor, John Haney at North Texas. My first trumpet teacher uh, was, was Lud Bomberg and then Keith Johnson. Wow. And Bruce Chittister, wonderful trumpet player who also taught at Northern Iowa. And so those guys as a team all kind of groomed me. And then I was lucky enough to take a, a few lessons from Bud Herseth and different guys uh, in Chicago. And uh, Forrest Bucktel was real nice to me. There were a lot of really nice, wonderful trumpet players. So after I got out of, uh, college, I did a master's and most of my doctorate, and I finally just got tired of going to school, and it was time to go out and make some money. So I did a little touring, and then um, I came back, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do, and Rich Madison called me and said, hey, there's a job part-time in Los Angeles that you'd be perfect for, and then you can play. And so I came out, and I got really lucky, and I got called for a commercial, and Bill Miller was the piano player. And Bill at the time was uh, Frank's uh, uh, pianist and mm -hmm. oftentimes conductor when uh, you know when it, when the other guys uh, Fontieri or um, and Nelson Riddle were not available and so uh, and Bill did this commercial and he just came up and said would you like to uh, give me your card and maybe uh, I like your sound you sound really wonderful and I contract for Mr. Sinatra maybe you know we can use you at different times I said boy I'd love that so it kind of worked out that I got into that rotation which was cool and then, you know, like everything else, just like you, I mean, you just kind of bounce from one gig to the other and you meet really good people. Don Smith was a very good friend, played lead on the Carol Burnett show for years, was very instrumental. And Pete and Connie Condoli helped me. Oh, my gosh. Oh, they my were, gosh. The count. They, they, were, <laughs> they were just sweethearts to me. Yeah. And and Conti would call me oftentimes late in the afternoon and say, I'm, we're supposed to be at King Arthur's with Frankie Capp's band and I can't make it, or I'm not going to be there on time. And can you go up there and play some music? And I said, yeah. And of course you'd show up and I go, I'm, I'm subbing for Connie Condole. And he says, no, you're just sitting in his chair, <laughs> which, was, which was exactly true right. <laughs> because my best solo was his throwaway. You know, I mean, it was just not even a contest. Right. But uh, the guys were in Hollywood were really kind to me. And I just, um, Jim Mooney at Sage and Sound, I started doing some producing on the side for uh, initially some small jazz groups. And then um, some of the college guys and high school guys wanted to record their band and I'd help with that. And then I just got real lucky and I got into some TV production uh, that Jim referred me to and um, did a little bit of the Magnum PI stuff. And so that kind of broke me in and kind of got me to look. And then Jim at Sage and Sound, that was kind of the jazz studio in Hollywood at the time, and really for about 20 years. And Jim was an excellent engineer and also a very good jazz trumpet player. Oh, I, wow. I, he was really a good jazz trumpet player. And I didn't know this for about three or four years 
until one day, you know, we were playing and he goes, that's an E flat, not an E natural. And I thought, now, how does an engineer know that that is, you know, the wrong note in the chord, right? And uh, so I started talking to me and, and turned out he was a very good jazz trumpet player. So I really enjoyed Jimmy, he taught me a great deal. Uh, we were working on MCI board with the MCI 24 track tapes and then 48 tracks. And, and it just kind of evolved from there. So over the years, um, you know, as a trumpet player, as the industry changed so much, because, you know, when I started, there were 22 TV orchestras at Universal. I mean, it was like the work was everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then along came the Yamaha DX7 and everybody oh. wanted that sound. So all of a sudden from 21 orchestras, we went down to eight and then down to four. And then Alf Clausen had the last full orchestra for the Simpsons, which just closed a couple of years ago. Yeah. And um, so that really changed everything. And um, there were so many wonderful players. And I thought, you know, I've got other skills here that I can utilize. Uh, as the industry changes. And I hate pounding people over the head for jobs. You know, it was like, I, I could play the trumpet as good as I needed to for any kind of work I was going to get called for. And I especially enjoyed the classical work at the Hollywood Bowl. I really enjoyed that. It was fantastic. Those guys were such nice people to work with. Yeah. But as the industry got tighter, I realized that I had these other skills. And so I was able to kind of build them an, an amalgam of my educational work as a college professor and then as a professional player and then became more recording and engineer and producer as that kind of evolved and uh it was a fun way to do it and i still you know still get to tour quite a bit in europe and i do uh, very specific things as a player but i spend most of my time now as an as an engineer or producer or mixer post-production you know specialist so but i still love to play and i still get to do it thank god from four or five different friends and contractors that use me so it's fun. Yeah. Well, one of the first times I've heard your name, and I told you this when I first talked to you, is that you're on those uh, Ashley Alexander albums, which if anyone listens to those, go if you haven't heard them, go get them. They're great. Yeah. Power Slide, and uh, they're all with Frank. Man, they're great. Yeah, they're all with Frank. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ashley plays Frank, or Alexander yeah. plays Bantooth, or whatever. Yeah, there were, I think we did four or five of them. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, Ashley was... Uh, uh, Ashley came to the University of Northern Iowa when I was a senior. Jim Coffin, who uh, had been the jazz director at UNI for three years, brilliant guy, uh, was a brilliant percussionist. And eventually Selmer and Premier hired him away from the college. They yeah. just offered him too much money. He eventually ended up as one of the senior vice presidents for Yamaha drums. Yeah. And uh, so we used to call him the drum god because every time he went to a convention, there was Jim and he was always, he was wonderful. And all the drummers and and he and he and Bill Watchers gave me the best most fun times because they were always giving me a bad time when they saw me at the conventions. But um, uh, my senior year of college, I went and student taught the very first nine weeks of the thing. Well, when I came back, here was a new jazz band director because Jim had been hired away, which was a shock because that year prior we had played at the Kennedy Center as one of the top eight bands in the nation. Well, here was Ashley, fresh out of North Texas with a DMA. But he had all these cool North Texas charts that no one had ever laid eyes on because Leon Breeden said, if you're gonna go, you pick out 50 of the charts you want and we'll make copies for you and you take them with you. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden we had doodle oodle and we had all of these fantastic North Texas charts. Yeah. And uh, so it was really fun. And Ashley and I really became good friends just in that last year. He was, he was, uh, uh, he was a gentleman to me, he was very honest. And so I left and then I, uh, went to North Texas, did my uh, my postgraduate work. And then when I came to Los Angeles, he was at UNI and all of a sudden he called me up out of the blue and he says, you're not going to believe this, but I'm going to teach at a college about 20 minutes from where you live. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, he said, I got tired of freezing and it's much nicer. In California. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, dude. Yeah. So he came out and, um, and he, he and his wife uh, met you were very dear friends. And one day we were, I don't know, we played a concert someplace and we were sitting in his jacuzzi. He was infamous for genteel living, you know, Ashley was always bigger than life and everything yeah. he did. And uh, so uh, we were sitting in the jacuzzi one day and we were, you know, drinking a glass of wine. And he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, I've been thinking about making a record. 
And he said, I've taught all these great players that graduated from all these colleges all over the country. You've started in North Texas and Northern Iowa. And then I've been doing clinics and summer camps and all this and that. He said, I, I've been thinking about doing an album. And he says, Frank Mantooth called me up and said he would write a bunch of charts that would feature me. And he had that new instrument called a Superbone. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, that guy was oh. a very good, he was a very good Dixieland trumpet player. I mean, really like Al Hurt level player, right? And so we do something like Cherokee, you know, and you get to the hard part of the bridge, right? And he played, and then he pushed one valve down and played the same damn thing on the trombone down a half step. And he would go through those things and never have to change anything because the instrument, you know, had his built-in modulation device. And I'd look at him and I would just give him, you know, bad comments all the time. I go, you're cheating. You're cheating, dude. And he would just laugh. But he really could play that Super Bowl. May Maynard Ferguson came to one of the concerts that we played and uh, nobody knew he was there, but he had been working with the Super Bowl himself. And he came up afterwards and he said, you know, actually, you get around on that thing better than anybody. And I think it was about three days later that Freddie Hubbard's agent called and had Ashley come and record with him. Oh, wow. Well, that was the kicker. So that, as soon as he did the Freddie Hubbard album, we were doing the big band album. And so then we did four or five of them. And it was really great. Lee Goss from the Commodore, you know, the, the bass trombone player that led the, the Commodores in, uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, Al, I mean, um, Dan Yoder the, from Penn State University ran the jazz, but all the guys were wonderful players. Gosh, yeah. great. a lot of the superstars that were kids at the time, Cat and Goo, Gordon yes. Goodwin, all of them, all these great, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you look at that band, it's like, wow. Yeah, and they were all unknown, just you know, all at the beginning of their career, yeah. and uh, we recorded the uh, first couple ones at Sage and Sound, and then um, and then I did a couple of them with the studios that I had friends with that I could get us in at a reasonable price, and then I could do the post production afterwards, and it saved money, you know. Yeah. And but it was really fun. I really enjoyed. They were wonderful records. Well, I, you know, I, I I use those a lot. I use those a lot, you know, to fine tune my ears when I'm doing stuff. So yeah. thank you well, for that. He had, he had some of the best product. I mean, you know, Jim uh, Jim Mooney was one of the best engineers in Hollywood. Everybody respected Jim, and I still have tremendous admiration and love for him mm -hmm. for all that he taught me and for all the great work, all the wonderful albums we did there. He uh, he taught me something about the business that I'd never known. Um, Shelly Mann was a phenomenal drummer. Yeah. And, uh, but Shelly had a real irk about studios. He said they never get the drums right. They always sound like crap. He was always dark in the studio. So we're doing this. I don't remember what the album was now. And Jim had asked me, he said, would you like to come in and help record this jazz group? Uh, because it can, you know, um, and his assistant was busy or something. I said, sure, I'd love to, man. Of course, you know, it's like Lou Levy and Shelly Mann and my God, you know, the best guys in town. So we went out and uh, as I recall, there were like three horns. And I think the trombone player, I think was Bill Reichenbach, but it might have been Maury Repass. Yeah. And um, uh, it, it had a bass trombone. It was an unusual combination. So I went out and we got the drum mics all set up on the drums and Shelly Berg the whole time just kept looking at me. And I went to move the kick drum into the kick and he says, I don't want a mic there. He said, I hate that sound. Don't mic my kick drum. I said, okay, Mr. Man, no problem. So I moved it out and I forgot that I, have, I, I just moved it out like two feet, like it wasn't gonna be there. Well, as it turned out, it was the perfect spot for that kick drum. So we went back in and Jim goes, what did you do to that kick drum? He, his kick drum never sounds that good. I said, I have no idea. And he looked out there and he goes, did he say anything to you? And he said, yeah, he told me not to put a mic on the kick drum. And he, I said, it's like two feet away. And he says, don't say a word to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so we recorded it and it sounded, and you know, Shelly at the end came in and he goes, See, when you don't have a mic on the kick drum, that's the way it's supposed to sound, even though it was the, what he was, what he didn't like was the close mic sound of the kick yeah. drum, which I understand, you know, because that was more of a rock modern sound. So it was very interesting. And I learned a lot from Jim about subtlety and how to deal with artists sometimes when things can get a little tense, you know. Yeah, you that, know? there's an art to that too, is dealing there with sure is. Yeah, it's part of the business and, yeah. uh, and it's real easy to get involved in, in, into it and get yourself in a lot of trouble. Well, see, Jim, and the reason you've been so successful is you've pretty much mastered that technique. 
Oh. Right. <laughs> you know, people, all people, you know, when you're recording, it's your soul, right? It really is. And, and you're leaving a signpost. And some people get so uptight about that. And the best thing you can do is just to help them realize, hey, anything can be changed and fixed. There's, we just re-record it if we need to. And so we don't really care if you make a mistake. Nobody makes a mistake. If you go back and listen to Clifford and those guys, there are chips all over those albums, but we don't pay any attention to them because the, the music is so magnificent, you know? Yeah. And those guys were phenomenal players. Oh yeah. But today we've set such a standard of perfectionism. It's, it, it's it, in, a, in order to achieve the perfectionism, I think we leave out some of the music and that's the greatest yeah. danger. Well, you know, going into that, Jim, I hope you don't mind. That's going to segue into my first question. Sure. Uh, this is from a, a buddy of mine that works out in New York. He's an engineer. His name is Craig. He says, Jim, I have a question for you. Do you think that we get so obsessed with perfection that we forget to leave the human aspect of music in our recordings? And where's the, where's the halfway point? Where's the compromise? Well, where's the line? Yeah. He, uh, I have actually made a perfect recording and it sucked huge. It was with an artist whom I will not tell you who it was, but you all know him very well. And he was obsessed with perfection. So we have a, we have a 40 piece orchestra and I had, I think I had 31 mics up and we went through every mic track and perfected every note. So if there was just a little weird thing on the beginning of the note in the violin section or the third trumpet player played a quarter note slightly behind or slightly flat, we fixed it. The budgets were unlimited. And we worked on that thing for five weeks. Wow. And at the end of the five weeks, we sat down and played it and, and I just didn't say a word. And he looked at me and he goes, what's wrong with this? And I said, we took all the music out, man. We took all the humanity out of it and we've lost the whole thing. And I said, I think we should throw it all away and start all over. And I said, what I really think we should do is you should leave me alone for three days and then come back here and then we'll, we'll do some tweaks. And, and I did, I threw the whole, I just took all the mixes out. We had the basic automation in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just mixed what the musicians played. You know, we, we hire the best musicians in the world in the studios. I mean, especially in Hollywood, we've got the creme de la creme. Right. And, and what they're spiritually putting out, I don't care if they were a quarter tone flat on a note. You'll never hear it inside of, I mean, if it's maybe a quartet, string quartet or something, but you're, I mean, you'll never hear that stuff. And what happens is when we start to clean it up so much, it does lose its human element. And um, where's, the, where's the point? I don't know. Uh, I think that comes down to every individual, but you know, my go-to techniques after the last, actually the last 20 years and it started with that artist when people come and say oh i can't wait to mix i can't wait to mix i go look let's do this why don't you let me get the mixes in the 85 90 percent range i'm gonna send them to you and you can listen and you can just listen to them and you make your notes and say i want some more french horns here and i need less of that and i think the lead trumpet's not loud enough here and could you give me more cymbals here and that kind of stuff and, uh, but what I discovered is I got much better mixes because they were able to sit back and look at the whole picture. When they're sitting next to you, they nitpick everything and it wrecks it. It just ruins it. So I, I almost won't let them come until I, I said, look, I'm going to send these to you. You study them. They come in eight, nine hours later. They're going like, this is perfect. And then when other people hear it, they go, it's one of the nicest albums we've ever done. Yeah. So I think that that's the, I, I agree that perfection Perfection can be our worst enemy. And that does take the humanity out of the thing. And the minute, when you lose that, even though you listen, you go like, it's so perfect, it sucks. Right. It's really, right. it's really a problem. Right. Because I've, I've been a part of projects where it's so perfect, it's sterile. Yeah. Well, that's and, what happens. It, yeah. it, humanity, you know, it's sometimes, sometimes that little chip on the trumpet solo is the best note that he played, you know? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's what it is. It's like, Oh, dude, I wish I could have thought of that. You know, flip, ba -doo -dee, but it's like, oh, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, yeah, that's, that's great advice, Jim, because I've seen a lot of people now are becoming obsessed with perfection. And it's, it's because, you know, we have the ability now to be perfect. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, thank you for that. Here's another question. 
Jim, this is from Ryan. Ryan's a buddy of mine out of uh, Utah. He runs a big studio out there. He says, Jim, what is your preference? We have high-end interfaces, and then we have AD, ADD converters. In your opinion, what is what are the pros and cons of both, and what do you use? Uh, uh, we have uh, – I have – uh, the Pro Tools HDX, but I also have the Apogee. And um, I, the ADD converters, I think, um, I think are probably more important than the interfaces. And that's by just a little tiny bit. But uh, I really think that, you know, if you get the front end, the right microphones and the right mic pre's, and you're getting that warmth, it's uh, it, in the old days, I, I shouldn't say this, but I, I'm going to. In the old days, uh, Al Schmidt and I were one of the last people in Hollywood. And, and I, uh, I remember this very distinctly because I wouldn't convert to Digidesign. I yeah. just hated it. I would listen to it and I'm going like, no, I'm not. It's just the worst sound in the world. Well, they had gotten there first. And then they let everybody else bypass them and they study what they were doing. And then of course, when it finally got, then they lured the boom and completely rebuilt the structure of the bit rate and the, the algorithms that they were using. And all of a sudden, Pro Tools became a musical Pro Tools as opposed to a sterile piece of garbage that I could not stand. Right. And um, I remember because Al Schmidt was doing a Loretta Lynn album at Capitol and they had, had both A and B because it was a big orchestra, big string section. And I came in and here were four Studer, 24 tracks with all the tape stacked up against the wall, right? Yeah. And, um, and they were all running. And I went in and uh, I, I said, what are you doing? I said, well, I, I came in here to see what you're doing. He said, uh, said, is it okay if I come in? He says, yeah. He says, we're taking a break. And, um, and he didn't know me very well. And he just knew that I, because I had talked to him and I said, you know, I don't use Pro Tools. I don't like it. I think it's a terrible sound. And, um, and he said, just between you and me, I don't either. And he said, but don't tell anybody. Yeah. So all of a sudden I walk in and hear the tape machines roll and he, he puts it on and she's singing beautifully and it's really this lovely ballad. And he said, what do you think? And I said, God, it sounds fantastic, Al. What a beautiful string sound you've got. He says, look, what do you think of this? And he hit the other button and I'm going like, yeah. I said, it, I said that has a little bit more transparency. And he goes, well, that's nice to hear. And, uh, I said, what is the, what's the difference? And he said, the one you're listening to is the new Pro Tools system they just brought in. It's the latest and greatest. And I went, oh my God, they figured it out. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it was, you know, and they, it was a complete change for Pro Tools. And I know it costs a lot of money for the digits of design, but they kind of waited and let everybody do a lot of pioneering for them. And I remember that transition because, and I was just getting ready to build my first studio and everybody was pushing me to go full digital. And I said, I'm not gonna do it because it sounds like crap. Yeah. And all of a sudden, boom, there it was. And it's like, you know, for 3% difference between analog and digital, the system, the whole country, the whole industry is going to digital. Yeah. So you're building an obsolete piece of equipment if you don't, and thank God they changed that just before I built that studio, that first one. Yeah. So, uh, I do like, I think the A to D converters are probably more important than the interface if you're getting a good front end up front. Okay, know. cool. Because so. uh, that's, that's, I always wondered why a lot of people um, don't, uh, you know, some people do interfaces and, but some people just go from their board to an A to D, a to D converter. Right, exactly. And I always wondered, you know, is there, is there a, a, a benefit from more you know, if, if you have real high-end a to d converters i like to get into the system as quickly as the less mm -hmm. between the original sound and where it has to be digitized that's the most the less is more always cool yeah i gotta here's another uh question for you <laughs> and jim this is great i mean this up man <laughs> it's like candy yeah it's <laughs> awesome so jim uh this is from uh Oh, Brian. Brian's a trumpet player as well. Oh, okay. Uh, and I think we talked to we talked about this. Jim, you've heard all the great studio pros in Los Angeles. Sure. In your opinion, what makes a great studio trumpet player? And for anyone aspiring to be a studio trumpet player, what do they need to have in their arsenal? Well, um, well, that's a huge question. Yeah. We could talk about it for three weeks. <laughs> and and of course, 
you know, the, the educational process cannot be bypassed. You know, nobody, uh, if you're missing anything in your arsenal, when you finally get a break in a place like Hollywood, if something is not there, they'll discover it and you'll not get called for any of that kind of work. And there were guys, and especially in the old days, who were really good at one thing and so good at it that that's all they did. But today, the, the moderns, you know, when they hire four guys for a, for a film soundtrack, you have no idea what's going to be there. And um, that's why they'll always have a, a Warren Looning and a Rick Baptist and, of course, Malcolm McNabb and then John or one of, many, one of the many trumpet players. So you kind of have, all right, if we get into this classical thing, these guys will be able to handle this. And if we get into this chase scene, then I got Rick there who can play triple C's with no problem. And if we get into this sweet jazz thing, there's Warren Looney, who also can play phenomenal Dixieland. He can sound like he's a 19, 1921. I mean, this guy could do anything on the trumpet. And so the, the thing that I have uh, observed, there, I think there are three things. The first thing is they have to have a great sound. It still comes back to that sound. And if, yeah. if the sound is not there and the pitch is not there, you're not gonna get that opportunity. And then I, 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 we assume technical facility, the ability to sight read, to multi-tongue, all that kind of stuff that's assumed. But if you've got that beautiful sound and, uh, and then you have to have developed a sense of finesse to know when you, you know, you, your musical knowledge is as critical as your physical ability. Because if you only play at a certain level all the time, volume wise and concept wise, and it's like all of a sudden, here's a piece that sounds like Maurice Ravel and you've never played Ravel or even listened to him. Well, you're gonna have a huge problem. And immediately, you know, uh, I mean, I, uh, I don't know Malcolm well, but I know many times I would hear him turn around to guys and go, you don't need to play that loud because you're pushing me to play louder and that's gonna change this whole scheme of things. Right. So I, I think the musical, uh, vocabulary that your ears have only by listening to kind of everything. You know, it used to be you were a jazz player or you were a classical player. And yeah. while that to some extent may still hold true in the spectrum of your primary work, when you're in a recording studio, they expect you to sound like Bud Herseth or Miles Davis or Cat uh, Anderson or whoever it's supposed to be that's your job and that's why they hire you so the the you know the sound the musical expertise and then of course the last thing is team playing yeah. because uh when you're young and trumpet players you know we're notoriously all vikings that's you know it's just, <laughs> that's, just that's a great built, analogy i love that that's just kind of built into the horn and uh and if you manage to survive that and not die from testosterone overdose <laughs> um you learn from the old gentleman, and this is where Pete and Connie Condoli were so kind to me, and many of the players, and they would go, you want to play lead on this? Yeah, and you would play, and they say, man, you sounded great. You played too loud. Why did you play that so loud here? You know, quit, quit playing with your ego and start playing with your brain. Oh. And, and the minute you get those kind of instructions, you start to step back and go like, why did I play like that? You know, it's like, you don't have to do that. So um, getting along with people is critical. Being able to stand your ground politely in, in situations where you might find yourself. Uh, but in the end, the trumpet section is equally, everybody's equally important. As you know, you're all soloists. And if one guy's having a bad day and there's three of you, the other two guys got to make sure that nobody knows that he's having a bad day or a chop problem. Um, we all know the, the story of in New York, was it Bernie Glow, I think? Yeah, Bernie. That, that was uh, the third trumpet player, or the fourth trumpet player on how many recording sessions that he was never there for because he was ill. Physically, he was not able to play anymore, but he was on every recording session because he was so beloved by that musical community. And I think it's Bernie. I hope I'm not got the wrong, I'm, my brain's slowly deteriorating here. Mm -hmm. But it was just the idea that he was so musically loved and such a such an integral part of that musical community that when it, when the income was not going to be there and everybody knew that he needed it, he was still on all those recording sessions. And yeah. people would go, at only occasionally some would go like, um, where's the fourth trumpet player? Oh, he went to the bathroom. He'll, he'll be back in just a little bit. 
there was no fourth trumpet player because it was, you know, they were just, that's how it worked. So those kind of family relationships, I think, uh, you know, the top 20 guys in Hollywood, they all know each other. They all respect each other. They're all really good friends. Yeah. Very rarely do I ever hear somebody say something, you know, Carl Saunders is such a brilliant trumpet player. I oh, love yeah. Carl. He's, my God, is he. And Carl, Carl will always tell you the truth. And guys will look and go like, well, I could take that two ways. But I mean, Carl, he was just saying, hey, well, you know, here's what I'm hearing, okay? Yeah. Not to be a put down or to make you feel better, but here's what I'm hearing. And this, all the smart players would go like, got it, Carl, thanks, no problem, got right. it. Because he was always, his whole goal in life has always been to make the music better. That right. really is Carl Saunders is. And he is such a phenomenal talent. I've recorded him many times and um, he would play these solos that were just like unbelievable. And then he'd come in, he'd go, you know, I think I could do better. And I'm going like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could think of 500 trumpet players in the world. Yeah. I would give their left arm to have played a solo like that. Yeah, he's, My he's, God, he would do another take, and it would be better. It was just, you know. So when you have that kind of talent, uh, uh, humility is a great teacher, isn't it? Yeah. You know? I, I, think, uh, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, the... Um, one of the things I uh, I've noticed is that uh, you know, and this leads me to my next question, which comes from Mark. Uh, and this, I'll just go with the question. He says, "Jim, tell us about the three things that a great engineer should have in dealing with talent, dealing with upper echelon talent. What are some of the things you think a great engineer should have dealing with?" upper echelon talent um well obviously if you're working with madonna or with barbara streisand or with mel torme or whomever over the years um you wouldn't be there if you didn't belong because they wouldn't hire you so then i think the next thing is um i always try to keep a low profile and be very polite you know, I worked off, off and on with Frank Sinatra for 11 years, and it was always Mr. Sinatra, because that was Mr. Sinatra. I was never going to call him Frank, ever, and I never did. And he would say, it's Frank, it's Frank, yes, Mr. Sinatra. I, he would laugh and laugh. <laughs> so, um, and I, I think if you are, uh, keep a low profile and be very pleasant and I always admitted when I didn't know something, I would turn to somebody and say, I'm not quite sure what they're asking me to do here. Do you have any, uh, she's saying up this, and th this is the, the, I guess the first thing is low profile and politeness. And then the second thing is trying to learn to interpret what they're asking for if they're not a trained musician. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, it's like they would come up with these descriptions, especially producers. And it's like, there's no magic there. And I was like, oh my God. What's magic? <laughs> Put some magic in it. And uh, I'll never, I, I remember uh, Gordon Goodwin on a film that she'll be, uh, not be talked about. Uh, they came in and one of the, and the producer, this particular line producer is not very good. And uh, they were doing this cut, right? For this, just a three, you know, 35 second, one minute cue. Mm -hmm. and and the guy's listening he goes what's that instrument i hate that instrument what is that instrument and so they're figuring and, and pretty soon he goes and they brought the bassoon up and he goes i hate that thing take it out <laughs> this is gordon so gordon says take it out and of course they mixed it in later they you know obviously you don't listen to those people they know what they're doing and then um he said two days later they're in and here comes this kind of quiet love scene and here's this bassoon playing way high in the upper register this very legato kind of haunting Stravinsky-esque thing and the guy goes what's that instrument and you know he's going like oh man here we go again and and, <laughs> and uh he said uh that's a bassoon in the altissimo register and he goes that's beautiful use that all the time so, <laughs> you know, so it's like they they don't really they really pay us to interpret mm -hmm. their their emotions and their their visions and um, I you know I've done a lot of records with people that were super talented that didn't really have any musical background as far as formal musical training but they did know what they want 
And so you just, I think the second thing for a real high-end engineer is to be able to interpret and not be afraid to give them what they ask for, even if you think it's not gonna be good, at least let them hear it, what it really sounds like. And if they go, that's exactly what I wanted, then that's exactly what you should give them because it's their project, it's their music, it's their soul, and it's their livelihood. And then of course, I think the third thing is the ability to be a perfectionist to the degree that we can uh, in making things that sound as good as they can all the way down the line. And never, I never put my emotional values into the, uh, into the production because it's not about my emotion. It's about my expertise to bring across the emotion that the artist wants, that the film director wants, that the actor wanted. Uh, and so it's like, I don't like this and here's why. Good, because now I'm not offended. You didn't piss me off. You didn't make me angry at you. It's like, okay, you wanted more pink and less purple. I got that, that's, that's easy to do. If you get so emotionally involved that it becomes yours, you become intransigent, you, be, you become snipey. You, you know, I know a lot of guys over the years that I worked with, especially as we get older, you know, they would start giving people a little grief when they would ask, oh, you know what the hell you're doing, you know? And I've never done that because I've always been proven wrong so many times that it's just, uh, I think uh, I do my best professional work and I love the work that I do but I remember that I don't have the final say in this because I'm not the guy doing the $2 million film, right? I'm not the guy that's paying $150,000 of studio time this week to make this come to life, they wave it. So my job is to help them in every way I can. And, uh, and invariably on projects that I thought really wouldn't be very good. And I really all the way down had this rub inside of myself. No one ever knew that. And then at the end, I would go like, you know what? They were exactly right for what we were doing. And I just couldn't see it. I was not, I hadn't seen the big picture and I hadn't seen the whole film and I didn't, I was dealing with snippets. And all of a sudden you go like, man, this is, they were right on the money. So, you know, that's, those are the three ways I approach it, you know, but try to stay emotionally out of it, be polite and let them try to interpret what they really are looking for. Those are the three important things I think for, when you're working with high end talent. That's great advice. That's great advice, Jim. Uh, here's another question. This is from uh, this is from Paula. She's actually a student of mine. She's taking sound engineering for me. So Good. anyway, she's uh, she say this. She says, Jim, how do you train yourself to how do you train yourself to avoid bad mixes? How do you train your ears to avoid bad mixes? I think what she's trying to say is, how do you recognize a bad mix right away um yeah <laughs> <laughs> <You're> like, sure <laughs> <laughs> i just uh i just got called into a tv show that was going to air uh, in about four days and uh, they brought me in just as an option and there were five things on that, that i thought were terribly mixed i could not hear the voice and this, this was voice talent and I'm sitting here going like, are you going to broadcast this? Is, is this finished? Yeah, what's the matter with it? And I said, I, don't, I can't understand the words. The orchestra is so loud. You're 20% you're too hot underneath the singer. And uh, your levels are already hot enough for broadcast. So you better, let's just do this for fun. And I'd pull them down 60 B and all of a sudden, it was a great mix. There were simple fixes. And bad mixes can be fixed very simply or they're unfixable. Okay. Uh, I, I worked on a, a big orchestra, a huge orchestra session from uh, uh, Europe that was recorded at Abbey Road. And it came in here uh, to be fixed because they were very unhappy with the final mix. And I think justifiably so. And it, mostly it was the composer because these critical elements of these unique lines, you know, that little solo flute in the background of the piccolo coming in, it's, and all, it, they were just not, it was not well mixed. And I found out later that it was not mixed at Abbey Road. Uh. And uh, they cut budget on it and they tried to, they spent all the money on the front end and then didn't want to spend the money on the back end. Yeah. And so, uh, but how do you, how do you hear it? Well, as you and I both know, and you can tell her, uh, as she gets older, it, it, I think if you're a musician and you hear something like, I know you, 
if you heard a full orchestra, if you heard a big band, if you heard a jazz group, and you're going like, why is the kick drum louder than the entire horn section? Okay. I have these guys, these horn players come in and they go like, now this is a percussion band and they never want to hear us. If you could ever get us up loud enough in the mix that we could actually hear ourselves, if you could put out an album with that, we'll pay you whatever we can, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going like, okay. And so, you know, and there's the other issue. Um, and they were right. I went back and listened to those records and it's like the horn sections at the other end of the football field yeah. and the congas and the triangle. And it's like so in your face. And um, in the old days when we only had a stereo image to work with, you know, left and right stereo, you had to put the horn players that far back because they wrecked the recording, you know, when they got loud, right? But uh, for, for her, she'll know a bad mix depending on her musical palette. Yeah. If you listen to a great big band and you listen to a bad mix, you're gonna go, wow, there's no trombones in the band. What, what, how come? Or why is the snare drum louder than the entire saxophone section all the way through this section? You know, or and the same thing with the string section, or the same thing. So when I was teaching young engineers, I just told them, I said, if you're not listening to a vast cross section of music at the highest level, you want to listen to the New York Philharmonic and Bernstein. You want to listen to the London Symphony. You want a Chicago Symphony with the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the best conductors in the world. And you need to know the best small group jazz things and you need to stay current. And then if you're going to do a rock album, well, what kind of rock album is it? What genre are we into here? You know, and if it's heavy metal, it's like, oh, well, it's just a bunch of shit. Well, no, it's not. And people that do heavy metal know when it's mixed right and they know when it's not mixed right. And if you don't have a clue, there's two things you should do. One, don't ever take that job because you'll get a terrible reputation. But it's like the same thing, you know, if, and I use this analogy and she'll learn this as she becomes more astute with a wider, you can never listen to just one kind of music and expect to be a recording engineer because that's not going to happen. It just won't work. And uh, the analogy that I used a lot is like, if I gave you 10 gallons of paint, each one a different color, but no one had ever taught you the colors of the spectrum. So I've got green, orange, purple, white, uh, you know, chartreuse, uh, yellow, you, you name it. I got 10 completely different colors there. And I say, Joseph, go up there and paint that wall red. You're gonna look at me and go, red? Yep, red. Which one is that? I said, that's for you to figure out. So you got a one in 10 chance of getting it correct, right? And that's kind of what music is. Music is the color of the human soul. You know, it is our inner spirit. Yeah. And, um, and, and you know, when you listen to a Nancy Wilson record done with Cannonball Adderley, how yeah. completely different that is than, um, than a Mel Torme Christmas album or uh, Julie London or all of these different artists through the eras. So the more you listen, it becomes a part of who, and I would tell my students, say, well, I listen to it. How many times you listen to it? Well, once. It's like, no, dude, <laughs> come back when you've listened to it a hundred times and tell me what you've learned. And then about three years from now, you come back and tell me when you've listened to it 500 times. And that's why in 10 years, you'll be 500 times better than you were when you listened to it just once. So, uh, there, you know, we can make a list of, is the bass too loud? Is there no bass? Is the kick drum louder than the, you know, they get all those sideline technical skills that we get to balancing. But uh, as you know, uh, mixing is painting. You can have the world's greatest orchestra record the world's greatest album. And if you go, if you get a bad mix, it's destroyed. Everybody sits back and goes like, it was so good in the room. What in the hell happened? You know, how could this be so bad? You know, and it's like, been there, been yeah, there. Been there and done that. You go back and you hear the album and you go like, oh my God, they ruined it, you know? Right. So, uh, I mean, so her question is well taken. How do you know a bad mix? But a lot of that comes back from some of it's experience. Some of it is common sense. And, you know, you've got your list of what you teach them. But in the end, it all comes down to these two things that hang on the side of our heads. And then what our experiences is music have taught us, which is why uh, I actually got into engineering when I was, I did my first album when I was 23. And the guy that had the studio was back in Iowa was real kind and showed me all this stuff. And so then 
uh, I got a chance. There was a brand new studio up in Minneapolis called Sound 80 Studios. Yeah. Uh, and Roger, forgive me because I've forgotten his last name, but the engineer was the nicest guy in the world. Mm -hmm. And he, at that time, now they have Steve Wright and all these fabulous trumpet players in Minneapolis. But at that time, there was not really a real good high note trumpet player in that region yeah. that they trusted. And so this guy said, would you like to come up and record once every two or three weeks, we'll pile some stuff up for you and you come in and play for me. And I said, sure, that'd be fantastic. Well, every time I went up there, I'd record trumpet for three, four or five hours. And then he'd give me lessons by not saying a word, but just by, I said, why do you do that? And he said, well, here's how the sound works. It comes in here and then you, blah, 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 blah. the matrix, right? Yeah. And um, so, uh, you know, I, th I, I just, I, I think that's the, the, the essence of this whole thing. But it's, it always comes down to these, you know? Right. And when you get it right, it's magic. And everybody goes like, oh, I love that record. And when you get it wrong, everybody doesn't say a word about the album. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the truth. <laughs> that is the truth. Did you do that record? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. Oh. Oh, that was you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, yeah, it was remarkable, really. <laughs> you know, yeah, right over the top of the head. I got a uh, uh, my buddy Travis, who's a uh, engineer out of Indiana, tells me. Oh no, I'm sorry, Illinois. Tells yep. me he says, "Hey Jim, I, uh, love your stuff. Are have you noticed that we've come become so obsessed with close micing and everything, we forget the magic we get with just." a few mics. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there's a real art form to that. And uh, we're, uh, I'm, I'm starting a, a project uh, as soon as COVID gets a little bit more under control. Um, Yuval Shrem is a, is a wonderful uh, filmmaker and excellent composer and himself an excellent engineer. Yeah. Um, and um, his company is going to do uh, a sampling library for strings using the best string players in Hollywood. And I said, you know, there's so many of those out, Yuval. He says, yeah, but he said that there, there, some of them are fairly good, but he said there are none of them that grab the essence of what this thing. And this guy is so smart. And um, I mean, we're, we're obviously we're going to have nothing but 10 and $20,000 microphones, wow. but we're only using four or five for the whole thing, you know, and instead of 19 spot mics and 16 of that and said, and in the old days, you know, uh, I mean, the, the Beatles recorded a two track or a four track, right? And yeah. it was where the mic was. And that kind of relates back to that story with Shelly Mann, where he said, don't bite, don't you mic my kick drum. I hate that. Okay. So, but the mic got far enough away that the mic really picked up an ambience, not only of the kick drum, but had the cool kit that when we put it in, just filled out that kit unbelievably. And so, yeah, I, um, uh, I always get nervous when I see 700 microphones on 12 musicians. It's like, <laughs> it's like oh shit, here we go, dude. Yeah. And, and um, uh, I, I was, um, there's a group called, uh, uh, what is it, Voctive? There are like eight singers. Yeah. And um, they sent me the film before they put it out on YouTube. And there are eight of them, and they got eight U67s about two feet from them. And they got, two coal, uh, coals overheads and that was it. And they sang and it's unbelievably beautiful. The singing is magnificent. The artistry is like world-class. Uh, same thing with Chanticleer, you know, they put the, the halo up above and those guys were 25 feet away from most of the microphones, you know, except maybe a spot mic or two for a soloist on a specific tune. So I, I do think that um, uh, you can get into terrible nightmares with too many microphones. That said, I've had situations where specifically they have asked me to use X number of mics on it, and then, and then it turns into a, you know, it can be done. I used uh, one, two, three, four, five, I used six mics on a Busendorfer concert grand that they brought in from Vienna. Uh, and it was an album for Marcus Berger and Bob Magnuson and um, um, uh, who's the drummer on that? Uh, it wasn't, uh, Peter Erskine, I guess, was the drummer. Yeah. And, uh, but that was a big nine footer. And mm -hmm. so I was able to place those mics strategically. And that piano was unbelievable. It was a $350,000 piano. They flew it from uh, Vienna to here, the Busendorfer, put it in the thing, had to sit here for three, four days, tuned it every day. They recorded on it for three days for the small group album and then did another classical album for four days. Mm -hmm. 
And then when it was done, they packed it up and they shipped it up to flat, um, up to um, uh, Alaska, Fairbanks, Alaska, to a big concert hall there that had purchased it. Yeah. And uh, but that piano was big enough that I could get interspatial those mics across it, and it did sound amazing. Yeah. You know, and uh, so the guys that, that were at the factory knew what they were talking about. They had experience and they yeah. gave me suggested and they strongly suggested that I did it. And I did. And it worked fantastically. I would have never mic'd it that way. I might have used four. I would have never used seven, you know. Yeah. Wow. So, but, but they knew what they were doing. So, but yes, I, I, I think more is less with miking, especially, well, with classical, you could ruin everything if you get too many mics up. Oh, my God, it's a disaster. You know, it's just, you don't want to do that. And um, yeah, I mean, you could do great things with 10 microphones in front of a 20 piece orchestra. <laughs> yeah. Tremendous. Um, I've, uh, I've seen the old capital days, how they used sure. to, you know, they, they didn't use many microphones at all, especially yeah. on the Sinatra albums. Yes, yeah, exactly. You know, Frank's U47 hangs there. It says Mr. Sinatra right on the mic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, um, I'm working on a project now where I'm trying to recreate that 60 sound. Sure. Uh, but let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, I, that now that people started logging on, the questions have started just like flowing in. Like yeah. crazy. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like, this is like- Careful what you wish for, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> so I would like to say this, um, you know, first of all, uh, we're almost out of time, but I just want to thank, first of all, Jim, would you be willing to come back? Sure, absolutely. I, I like to talk about the music business, and yeah, I mean, and it's fun to. And you know, these are all really excellent questions. Yeah. And uh, uh, engineers, you know, and, and musicians. But right now, of course, with the COVID thing, musicians are going through emotional withdrawal because we're used to be around each other all the time. But engineers lead a solitary life a lot. You know, there's this beautiful three days of tracking where everybody's there and then it's you and the dark room and the bobs and the buttons and the sound, which for me is still thrilling. I still, I sit down and I turn it on and I, and all of a sudden my wife walks in and goes, are you gonna sit in here all damn day for 24 hours? I go, what, what do you mean? I said, I've only been here three, four hours. She said, well, you came in here at eight o'clock this morning and it's 10 o'clock right now. Oh, wow. I said, that's only two hours. She said, no, it's 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> 14 hours? Because it just flies by. You know, your mind, you know, it's, it's just this world of sound. And uh, sound is always what attracted us, right? Sound is the essence of our soul. We, that's why people love music so much, because it touches their soul. And we have many different kinds of sound, thank God, and many different magnificent artists from every genre, every race, every culture that enrich our lives so much so uh, i'm always enthusiastic to talk to and i learn something from every engineer i talk to i watch and i go how did you do that they go oh this blah, 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 blah. it's like dude i gotta remember that you know if i could just remember half of what i forgot i'd be, I'd be <laughs> exactly <excited. laughs> yeah and I, you know the, the thing is like i mean i think people just started watching this I'm like oh no they started asking. and so i got bombarded with questions I'm like guys I mean, out of the time yeah, I don't yeah wanna... i'll be happy to come back joseph absolutely just tell everybody that sent you things say hey we'll do this again and uh, uh happy to talk try to answer questions you know it's after yeah. uh like i said I, I i made my first record when i was 19 years old and then wow. i made uh and i'm gonna be 70 so wow. i'm this for yeah almost doing it for a little bit huh yeah yeah <laughs> and 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 what was so cool is that Everybody helped me. You know, you hear all these things about how bad people are and how selfish people are and this and that, and like that guy's gonna take my job and I won't be able to, and all that crap. I, I never really experienced that. Uh, I, I, had, I had Connie Condoli and Pete Condoli, like I was getting sub work that I should never have gotten, but it was the new kid in town. It's like, they were always looking for the future, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if we don't train people that know what you know and what I know, when they're 17, 18, 19, 20, and get them up to where they're rolling at 25, 26, what's gonna happen when we're not here anymore? Right. And all this beautiful sound that could be created by human beings in all of these different genres will be gone. It, it, yeah. will, it will be lost. That, so we can't allow that to happen. And uh, that's, why, that's why every good musician is a teacher in some capacity. Right. And every good uh, teacher is a musician, we hope, right? Right. So, 
And so I love to talk about this. So if anybody, the guy's got questions, I'll talk till I'm blue in the face, which you probably, <laughs> well, probably can tell blue. I'm good at, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And, uh, you know, uh, Jim, it's been amazing. I mean, I wish we had more time. I just don't want to take up your time, buddy. Sure. No, I understand. And I know you're busy. You got. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got a mix waiting right behind me. I got to so, get uh, guys, uh, like I said, if you, if you, Jim, we'll, we'll have you back as soon as we can. Sure. And it's been an honor. Seriously, it's been a pleasure just talking with you, man. Yeah, Joseph. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for your patience with my little accident that I had a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Unplanned, yeah. unplanned but uh, I'm always happy to talk uh, to trumpet players and, and, and engineers. Absolutely. It's one of the beauty, beautiful parts of our industry. Yeah, Jim, you, yeah, like I said, man, this has been great. This is, I'm eating this stuff up. Well, and uh, I want to thank all of you who joined us today. And again, Jim will be back. He will be, I promise. He will be back and we'll get to your questions. And I want to thank everybody. Have a great weekend, Jim. Thank you again, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you, Joseph. All right. Thanks, everybody, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Thanks, brother. See you.